This video is all about the transformation experiment, which whether you did it in school or not is something that you need to know for AP Bio. Let's go. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover all things AP Biology. In today's video, we're going to be covering one particular lab or experiment that you're supposed to do at school, which is transforming bacteria with plasmids. Since COVID though, I know that many schools have not re-implemented labs back into their AP curriculum, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to teach you guys about what this lab is about and what you're supposed to get out of it. And by the way, this is all in the context of Unit 6 in this small subsection on biotechnology. Although when we're discussing transformation as a lab experiment, do keep in mind that it is something that happens naturally in the wild. So let's review what it is exactly. Transformation is a phenomenon wherein a bacterial cell can uptake foreign DNA from its external environment to incorporate it into its own genetic repertoire. This would allow the bacteria to become effectively transformed and able to produce the genes located on this foreign DNA. And this actually isn't anything new. Back in Unit 6, we learned about Friedrich Griffith, who observed the transformation of bacteria wherein the non-pathogenic R strains became transformed when mixed with heat-killed S strains that spilled its DNA that contained disease-causing genes. But here we're going to be inducing transformation in a control setting. So let's begin by setting up the important foundations to tackle this lab properly. So we wanna put DNA into bacterial cell. So it makes sense for us to talk about each of these components first. For bacteria, we're mostly going to be working with E. coli, which is one of the most representative prokaryotes that we use in an educational lab setting. But do keep in mind that the strains found in the wild do cause infections, which is not fun at all. But thankfully, the ones that you're gonna be using in the classroom have been genetically modified to not cause you any harm, but we should still be pretty careful. For DNA, we're not gonna be using any random DNA, but pre-made plasmids that have been designed and created for you. Typical vendors include companies like Fisher Scientific or Carolina Scientific, but what's important for us to know is what these plasmids look like. So supposing that we order something like pea green from one of these companies, we can take a look at the manual or the diagram that shows more information about the genetic data that's contained therein. In this picture, we can see that pea green contains about 4,000 base pairs, has its own origin of replication, and most importantly, contains two genes that we're highly interested in, GFP and AMPR. Now, GFP is where this plasmid gets its name from. The gene GFP produces a green fluorescent protein, which, as the name suggests, produces a protein that fluoresces green under UV radiation. But the plasmid also contains the AMP-R gene, which we should take a closer look at. AMP comes from the word ampicillin, which is an antibiotic. Antibiotics, of course, inhibit the growth of, or simply kill bacterial cells altogether. This AMP-R gene, however, encodes for a protein called beta-lactamase, which has the capacity to inhibit the actions of ampicillin. Then I think we can reasonably assume that the bacterial cells with this plasmid should be able to grow on plates that have antibiotic ampicillin on it. And we'll see why this is important in a little bit, but just keep this part in mind for the time being. Great, now that we have chosen the bacteria and our plasmid, we just have to do the legwork to get these plasmids into the bacteria themselves. First of all, we wanna work with a clonal colony of E. coli as that would control for any potential differences in outcomes we may observe due to the genetic differences. The way that we do this generally is to transfer cells from a single colony on a nutrient agar plate and allowing them to undergo binary fission in a liquid broth in a flask or a test tube. Once we have the right concentration of cells that we wanna use for the experiment in our flask, we can begin the experiment by transferring some of these bacterial cells into two separate test tubes. One of these test tubes is typically referred to as the plus plasmid tube, while the other is the negative plasmid tube. As you can already predict, we will be adding the plasmids to the plus plasmid tube while adding just the buffer or the solution into the negative plasmid tube to establish our negative control. Once the mixture of plasmids or the liquid without the plasmids has been added to our bacterial test tubes, we'll begin by performing something called a heat shock to try and get these plasmids into the bacterial cells. So here is the general breakdown of how this works. First, the tubes are held in an ice bath for anywhere between five to 30 minutes. Then the tubes are quickly placed in a 42 degrees Celsius water bath 
for about 30 seconds. Now this sudden change in temperature and the heat itself creates an increased permeability in the bacterial membrane to allow them to suck up these plasmids from the surrounding solution. We return the tubes back into an ice bath for a while before transferring the bacterial solution onto our nutrient agar plates. But here is where you need to pay close attention. We plate each of the plus plasmid and the negative plasmid bacterial test tubes onto two plates each for a total number of four plates. Beginning with the plus plasmid bacteria, we plate them on a regular nutrient agar plate and a nutrient agar plate containing ampicillin, the antibiotic. Likewise, we plate the negative plasmid bacteria onto our regular nutrient agar plate, as well as the agar plate containing the ampicillin again. Now, this is where most of the AP Bio questions are gonna come from. So let's take a closer look at why we're plating them on these specific plates. One important fact that we have to acknowledge is that while our heat shock protocol works pretty well, there is still a very low chance that plasmids actually enter the bacterial cells. So as we stare into our test tube, we have to figure out which of these bacteria are transformed and which are not, and that is where ampicillin resistance gene on the plasmid and the ampicillin plates come into play. See, if bacteria were successfully transformed with the plasmid, they'd be able to produce the ampar gene and thereby produce beta-lactamase, resulting in their survival on that ampicillin plate. But if they weren't transformed, then they wouldn't be able to survive, meaning that our ampicillin antibiotic on our amp plates can act as a screen to filter out bacteria who were not transformed with the plasmid. So these are the results that we should expect to see. On the top left plate, where we plated plus plasmid group on just the nutrient agar, we see that there's just a ton of bacterial growth everywhere. Here, we should expect some of these colonies to be transformed, but many not. But that's perfectly reasonable because the plate does not contain any ampicillin to kill the non transform colonies anyway. On the top right is the treatment plate where we talked about before. Here, ampicillin would have eliminated all of the non transform bacteria that were susceptible to ampicillin, resulting in 100% of the colonies growing here having been successfully transformed. On the bottom left, we have the negative plasmid cells, but they grow perfectly fine on the nutrient agar. Again, there's nothing to stop them from growing here, so that makes total sense. But on the bottom right with the ampicillin plate, no bacteria should grow as there was no plasmid addition during the entire protocol of the experiment for these cells. Now we also attribute terms like positive control for the two plates that had full growth, while the negative plasmid on the amp plate with no growth is considered to be a negative control. Now we should take a moment to discuss why these controls are so important. So let's imagine for a moment that in our negative control plate, we observe bacterial growth. This is a huge problem because what it could potentially mean is that the original cells that we began with were already resistant to ampicillin because otherwise there's no way these cells could have grown there. But this would also mean that in our treatment plate where these supposedly transformed cells are growing, some of them may be there not because they were transformed but because they were already resistant. Now we also want to make sure that the positive controls have full growth too. Imagine for a moment that there was no growth on the negative plasmid nutrient agar plate. This could mean that that the heat shock protocol or any other mistakes along the way could have made the cells inviable or that no cells were transferred over to the plates. But this is a problem too, because if the cells were in fact inviable, then the reason that there's no growth on our negative control may not be from ampicillin, but rather the fact that there were no surviving bacterial cells during the procedure. And as we mentioned before, without a proper negative control then, we have no idea whether the cells were already resistant to ampicillin as we had described before. So at the end of the day, all all of the plates should look exactly like how we'd want them in this picture right here to ensure that all of the cells growing on the amp plates in our positive plasmid group are in fact transformed cells. Now, just returning to the plasmid that we had used for this theoretical experiment, we use pea green, a plasmid that contains a green fluorescent protein. Knowing what you know about the plates that we prepared, I think we can now say some things about how these plates would look under UV light. Our positive control that received the plasmid under UV light would have most non-fluorescing cells with some green fluorescence coming through here and there in certain colonies. And that's because there's no ampicillin screening out the untransformed cells, which now grow alongside some of our transformed cells on this particular plate. Our treatment plate with the plasmid and ampicillin should have colonies that all glow green because 100% of the surviving cells on this plate would have the plasmid and therefore the GFP gene as well. We can also say that none of the cells in our minus plasmid positive control plates should fluoresce green at all as there were no plasmid presented to any of the cells in this particular group.
As you can see, the important aspects of the transformation lab is not necessarily memorizing the procedure or learning the transformation efficiency calculations, but rather the underlying ideas of how prokaryotes could alter their genetic information through plasmid and how scientists and students could leverage antibiotics and their resistance genes to design a simple but effective experiment. And hey, if you found the information on this video helpful, consider subscribing to our channel for more content just like this one. And be sure to hit that like button and drop a comment if you have any questions too. This has been Mikey with Avo Prep Academy. We'll see you in the next video.